You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. What's up, guys? Welcome into Good Morning Lambo. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. You can email us, Packers Total Access at gmail.com. You can text us, 865-658-5824. We got Tim back in the house, fresh off a little road trip. I know, uh, Tim, what, what, right, right as we went live, you went, oh, shoot. It's probably because I had the wrong logo up, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, I just switched. The- <laughs> <laughs> There's always something. We sit here for 20 minutes, and I'm like, okay, everything's ready. And then as soon as I hit live, it's like, Crap, didn't do that, didn't do that, didn't do that. So, anyway, how you doing, Bob? Doing good, man. Happy to be back, man. This is yeah. uh this is great. And um uh, man, just shout out to uh to Coach Haddad, man. Uh caught up yeah, on the, the pod. Just um man, victory sports, man. Check it out for sure. That that is uh priceless knowledge and insight into the game. And um, you know, really respect what he's doing, you know. You're making better high school players, which makes better college players, which makes better professional players. And, you know, coaching at every level is so important in this game we love. And, uh, you know, a uh, cup of diesel uh, salute to Coach Haddad over there for real. And um, appreciate the knowledge, man. I learned learned so much from that pod yesterday. Yeah, he's he's a really great guy, very in-depth, and he's got an awesome YouTube channel too like they do over at Victory Sports. So if you're not interested in, in purchasing one of the extensive packages they've got, I mean, and they these this is top to bottom like an offensive coordinator's guide, several templates, same thing with D.C. Uh, they've got everything covered, but they've got a YouTube channel where they just break down plays and break down specific technique. Um, him and his bro- I think his, it's his brother Danny Haddad that's on staff too. His dad has been the coach at that high school forever, and they are. I think they won. It was last year. It was twenty. I think it was. I don't. I don't want to misquote. It was in the within the last five years they actually won the national coaching staff of the year by USA Today. So they're like they're on top of their game. And I stumbled upon them looking for information just like he looks for in the off season. Um, and and that's the whole reason he started Victory Sports was. He was, you know, during the downtime of the offseason, he's coming through trying to find every bit of information and teaching tools he could find. And he was like, man, there's really a, a lack of this, you know, on uh, on the Internet. So they started creating their own material as they learn stuff. They would share it. And really, it's kind of a we're kind of a microcosm of, of what they're doing, too. We're trying to learn. And as we learn, we're just sharing along the way as we learn. So other Packer fans can kind of dig into what it is the Packers are doing. Obviously, he's not a Packers fan. He's a Patriots fan and a football coach. So uh, it's just cool to kind of get those different, you know, different, uh, I don't know, uh, angles, I guess you could say. But look at this, Tim. I ordered this soup mug, right? You guys know I drink my coffee out of a soup mug. We got to have plenty of room in that mug, right? I ordered one for PTA. Bro, this thing, look how big it is. (laughs) Holy cow. I'm assuming it holds like 20 ounces or something, but – Bro, we a plenty of diesel cranked up this morning, my man. Plenty of diesel <laughs> in the cup. So I love it. Anyway, um, Blake B says this ain't Ch- Chick Fil A. PTA always open, man. It sure feels that way. <laughs> Which <laughs> it is Sunday too. Chick Fil A's closed. By the way, man, Chick Fil A, top of the line, man. Top of the line. <laughs> quality service, quality food, just everything you think of. See, now y'all getting me hungry. SDM40 says, need a sausage McMuffin this morning. That sounds good, too, man. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Appreciate y'all hanging out in here. I'm with you, Justin. Justin uh, pops in and says, I've never been more excited for an offseason. You know, we talked about that with Jake last night, Tim, as we wrapped up. And we'll, I guess we'll kind of pick up where we left off last night. It, the way the season ended, it doesn't even feel like it ended with a loss. It's, it's like you created so much momentum on the back half of the season. You obviously go in there and just boat race the Dallas Cowboys. And it's just like, man, what are we doing next? What's what's next on the schedule, right? Who's who's getting signed? Who's getting released? 
What are we doing in free agency? You know, the big thing is the coaching staffs. We're right in the middle of it. I think many people don't realize that you get the D.C. hire and you just think, okay, it's over. All right, we got our D.C., let's move forward. There's a lot of things, I think, that could still shuffle along the way. Um, We were kind of diving into it a little bit last night. I'll give you a quick recap of what's happened, which I'm sure you're well aware, Tim, but just in case someone else missed the show, Jerry Montgomery, um, the Packers defensive line coach and run game coordinator, um, is not returning next season on Jeff Halfley's staff. Okay, so it's already been announced there. He won't be back on Halfley's staff. Montgomery has been with Green Bay Packers since 2015 and already has multiple opportunities to coach elsewhere. I don't think Coach Montgomery is going to have any problem finding work, um, you know, obviously. But this, what this tells you, too, and, and you got to kind of read the tea leaves, read between the lines here, how much of this defense is going to change under Halfley? Immediately people go, well, we're going to a 4-3. Everything's changing. You know, the, the when you talk about the 4-3 and the 34, we're in nickel the majority of the time, so it's it's only going to be on the field against those, you know, 21 and 12 personnels, right, those 21 and 12 sets. With that being said, um, the big thing for me is you now need maybe an extra linebacker or two, and you need one fewer defensive lineman on the finished roster. That's just my opinion. Now, he may come out and surprise us all, and stick with a 34 front. But I think what you're going to probably see is a 4-3 with more linebackers, and they'll mug in the line of scrimmage is kind of what it looks like to me. So, um, And that's just on the surface. You'd probably have to go back and watch the San Francisco tape from when he was in San Francisco, even though he wasn't the play caller there. He was just a DB coach. I imagine he's going to try to do some things that Robert Sala does. He's mentioned in several interviews, like I was telling Jake last night, several interviews he's mentioned – Halfley's mentioned, you know, when I talk to my friends in the NFL, he keeps talking about that. I think the number one person he's probably talking about is Robert Sala. So if you kind of dive into what Robert Sala's done the last couple of years, probably give you a good a good first step in the right direction of here's how Jeff Halfley may build his defense. Right. So you're probably looking at a four three approach from the Jets perspective, which is basically one gap, you know, kind of downhill when it comes to the defensive line quick off the line, trying to get that that penetration right off the bat rather than a 34. You're kind of engaging, moving laterally, and controlling two gaps. So uh, we got Jacob in here with us now. Jacob, how you doing this morning, bud? I'm doing good, man. Looking at uh, Tim. Haven't seen you in a while. Got that fresh new fade. What's going yeah, on? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I got to also give a shout-out to Coach Haddad. Yesterday I jumped on like three minutes after y'all started, and I just I started listening, and then I just kept listening. And I was like, <laughs> I really don't have anything to add. I'm like, I'm just going to, I'm going to sit here and just listen because I'm learning and Emilio can play the part I'm playing, which is just asking questions. So I was like, I'm just going to sit here and listen. I was yeah. telling Clayton, I had to, I had to stop and, and wait. Cause I, I wanted to watch because there was so much, so much gems um, on the video feed. And uh, yeah, shout out to Emilio too, asking uh, really good questions. Um you know, you want you want to learn more. Ask ask good questions. You'll get you'll get better answers. And um, so, shout out to our very own Emilio. But uh, that was that was priceless information yesterday. I love it. Yeah, it's kind of funny too because I when I was in this journey of trying to just teach myself a little bit more, and I'm still learning a ton. Um, Same here, I man. Looked up, I looked up like tutorials and um, very like uh, beginning X's and O's type stuff. And the first thing that popped up was victory sports. I must've watched like seven hours straight of victory. Like I'm telling you guys watch some of their stuff. The production is really, really good. And they break it down in a way that's really simple. And it's like straight to the point. It's, it's really cool. Yeah. They've got some of the best material, some of the best content. That's the first place I check. If I've got a question or something that I don't fully understand, I go right to their YouTube page, search it and, uh, and fire away. But yeah, they're, they're just an amazing family creating that, that family legacy together and coaching, um, just phenomenal people. So, um, we'll see Justin in the chat says, I'm so excited for this off season free agency draft. Matt LaFleur knows what he has with this offense and the schemes being designed for next year. Stoked. Yeah. That's the thing too, right? Like we're all looking at what happened this year and we'll always go back and watch that tape. We'll, I'll continue to post highlights on Twitter, throughout this year from I'm going in chronological order from, you know, week one to week two and on and on everything that I had tweeted out as far as highlights on game day, we're just kind of reliving those and post them along, but you're going to see some things change. They're going to see stuff. You know, we started the season off Rocky on offense, right? And then they cranked it up in the second half. Well, what's going to happen is other teams are going to watch our second half tape more specifically the last four games of the season. And they're going to find ways to combat that. 
that's why sometimes you come in week one and you have kind of a, a late start, right? Like people talk about how LaFleur's teams are slow starters. I don't think it's a coincidence that they're strong finishers. And what that means is you kind of get things working, you know, those last four games of the season, you finish on a high note for the most part. Teams have all offseason to dig into that. So when they come back the next season, they're prepared to stop what you were doing well at the end of the year. So as a coaching staff, you can approach it one of two ways. You can completely reinvent the wheel, which I don't think we should do. I don't think anybody should do. But you've also – the other one is you come in and continue doing what you were doing at the end of the year. Well, they've got kind of a leg up on you schematically. It's just, are your players going to perform better than theirs? And that's why you struggle sometimes coming into the first part of the year and why it's so important to make those quick adjustments. You know, we ended the year um, 2022 doing a lot of the sifting, doing a lot of the pulling, things like that on the offensive line. But we come into the year of 2023, and you heard me talk, we got to simplify things. This offensive line, they're not able to do what we're asking them to do right now. And like – like uh, Mike Wall pointed out, you know, they're even struggling with some of their zone blocking techs. It took a little bit. You had to back up, punt, readjust the offensive line as far as how you're going to attack the running game. And then by the end of the year, you started seeing the sifts again. You started seeing the pull. Yeah. Yeah. And we were running pin and pull pretty well there towards the end. Um, <laughs> and Jonesy was uh, putting in that work, man. It was uh, it was fun to see. And sometimes it does. You just got to take a step back. Uh, Coach Haddad referred to that yesterday, you know, keeping mm-hmm. it simple. And then you then you bring that complexity in. This game's complex enough as it is. <laughs> you know, you don't you mean you don't need to sprinkle more of that on um, when you're you know building your uh, your game plan early. And um, you could tell, yeah, we struggled with that early in the year. But uh, you know, by you know week 13, 14, it really <laughs> you could see we were running that a lot more successfully. So yeah, no doubt I'm about it. Twenty four as well. You were talking about keeping it simple. I love this quote that was pulled from uh, Jeff Halfley. It said, and I just tweeted it out, but, you know, trying not to self-promote my Twitter here, but this, I found this quote online and put it in with a video that uh, next up, you know, they did with this interview with Halfley. But it says, uh, New Packers defensive coordinator Jeff Halfley has said, quote, I'm big on technique. I'm big on fundamentals. But if a guy can play at a high level, don't try to change him to fit exactly what you think he should be. Just get him better. And it, it really, it truly is just simplicity at the core. It's like, okay, yeah, we want you to do it this way. And, it, and it's what Coach Haddad talked about a little bit too. Like you want to teach that technique, but you know what? If they're getting success out of doing it a different way, let's let's just make let, – okay, they're already doing that good. How can I make them better? Rather than, okay, yeah, you're doing that good, but you're not doing it the way I want to do it. You know? That might be – uh you know, some insight into why they may have moved on from coach Montgomery. You know, he's, been, he's been, uh, he's been there for a while. And, and first of all, nothing but respect for, for coach Absolutely. Montgomery. Absolutely. Great coach. Um, fun to be around at training camp. Uh, met him a couple of times last year, all around good guy, good coach. Um, but yeah, it might be, it might be time um, for a change there, especially on the front. And, you know, that could be Coach Halfley looking at what we have on that D line and that talent, and he probably just wants to utilize these guys in different ways. And uh, mm-hmm. it's not a knock on Coach Montgomery, you know. Everyone has to move on sometimes, and I'm with you, Clayton. I mean, he'll probably have another job, and you know, keep an eye on the ticker. He may have another job in ten minutes here. We don't know. So. <laughs> right. What were you gonna say, Jake? If you had your hand up, buddy. No, I just I was basically gonna reiterate what Tim kind of just said in a different way, where it's like you know two different people can look at the same exact thing and see completely different Absolutely. possibilities, aspects. And maybe it is, it's just that maybe Jerry Montgomery or uh, uh, different coaches have been looking at this group of guys and saying, this is what we need them to do. This is what we need him to do. Whereas, you know, Halfley comes in and he goes, this is what this guy can do, which is amazing. I'm going to let him do that. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to allow him to just be the absolute freak of nature that he is yeah. and kind of, you know, nurture that part of him versus trying to put a square peg in a round hole. And yeah, I think exactly. maybe what Halfley is looking at is like, oh, wow, I've got a lot of puzzle pieces here that maybe for whatever reason in years past, Petten, you know, whoever you want to name, I just didn't know how to utilize these players the right way. I look at Halfley and I, I see the same kind of quiet confidence. What do we call it? Humble swag. Yeah, I see that weird humble swag while he's sitting there. He doesn't seem very, you know, dominating. He's not a very big guy. He's not imposing, but he just, for some reason, when I watch him talk, I'm like, this guy knows what he's talking about. And it yeah, seems no. like the game isn't, 
too big for him. It doesn't seem like the NFL is too big for him. If anything, yep. it seems like he's just, you know, he's game planning. It's like when you watch somebody that's good at chess and your opponent makes a move and you kind of just go, <laughs> like in your opponent's like, <laughs> you laugh at. Like I just took like 30 seconds to try to make this move. The guy just laughs and whatever. <laughs> I, I think, it, I really do think that he seems like it's, the moment's not too big for him, that he he has a plan, that he sees the guys that are in his repertoire now and he's like excited about it you know he seems like he's like a new kid with a bunch of toys to play with and i'm i'm, I'm jacked he also yeah. seems like the type of coach that'll run through a wall for his players and, yeah. and yeah. that guys want to play for um which is which is very important with a young team you know we need that we can't can't have a disconnect um between the players and the and the coach especially on the defensive side of the ball so i'm looking forward to seeing the future man for real you know, the players have got to They've got to believe that you know what you're doing, right? That's that's first and foremost. You can be, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if the people you're trying to teach aren't going to listen, and I think we would all agree, we've seen that the last couple of years is like it, it, they they weren't really embracing the hey, look, this is how zone match works. It was more of okay, I know I'm supposed to do that, but I'm just going to hang out right here, right? Um, so. It, you know, it doesn't matter how much someone knows. It's can you convey that message to the to the pupil, right? And can you get the results? You know, people people they'll follow you anywhere if they think you know where you're going, right? We've seen that throughout time, and in, in in a lot of negative ways, to be honest. You know, through throughout society, it's just a if someone is if someone is dead set passionate on what they're doing, and they convince the the people that they're speaking to that, hey, look, I know what I'm doing here. Just follow me they'll go to the end of the earth for them, right? You know, the old Lombardi quote, once, you know, what do you say? Battles battles are won in men's hearts. And once you've won their hearts, they'll follow you anywhere. Yep. It, it holds true in anything, anything in life. Uh, but with Jerry Montgomery, I think the big change there, what it tells me is, okay, you're moving on from your defensive line coach. He's also the defensive running game coordinator. What it tells me is, probably going to a four or three you know we're still kind of some of us are a little bit like well we may stick with a three four you're scrapping the d-line and the run game coordination jerry montgomery has been in the 34 you know since 2015 even you know even under mike mccarthy you, you know if it was dom capers and i can't remember how long dom was here but let's say dom was here in 2015 i can't remember if he was or not if he was that was 34 mike Petton, that was 34 joe barry that was 34, 34. So now all of a sudden you're going from 34 two gap up front, kind of sliding bigger bodies, 300 plus pound defensive linemen in that 34 jam to now you're going to one gap and quicker penetration. To me, if you look at the way the defensive line is built, what is the strength of our defensive line? Like we talk about Devonte White and how he struggles against the run, right? The main thing is tackling. When he gets to the ball carrier, he really he's just not a good tackler at this point stage in his game. But he's very quick. He's got that first that first step, that twitch. He kind of fits that that interior forty three look more than a thirty four, in my opinion. So um, I'm excited to see how that all plays out. So I, I wanted to talk about that because you've got a defensive line coach vacancy as well as a run game coordinator vacancy. Okay, so keep that in mind. The other move was the Packers' defensive quality control coach, Justin Hood, is joining the Falcons as secondary coach. He's reunited with Jerry Gray in Atlanta. So he was let go. He goes on to coach secondary. I imagine that defensive quality control on the on the uh, the pecking order list, if you will, is below position coaches, okay? So you're probably looking to bring someone in that – you know, uh, is out of a job, obviously, in the NFL. It's not like something like, okay, we'll take this guy who's a defensive line coach and bring him in as quality control. Although, if you give him more money and the team doesn't block it, I'm sure you could do that. I just don't think that's probably the case here. So that's another spot that you've got open. So if we just take a quick glance at the coaching staff on the defensive side of the ball, <laughs> you've got – you like those X's? <laughs> I'm sorry. Got, it's the X's. <laughs> I, I was like, maybe I shouldn't do this. And I was like, it made me giggle. So I went, no, let's just stay the hell with it. <laughs> so you've got – yeah, it makes you think. Roadhouse. 
That's what we should have had. I should have done a screen grab of him with the spin kick and just put that over the person's oh. face. <laughs> no disrespect, I promise. But this is the best way I knew to go. Here are the vacancies. So, uh, Jeff <laughs> Halfley, for those visual learners out there, anyway, Jeff Halfley, your defensive coordinator. Um, so now you see, uh, j- let's just go from left to right and then down. Uh, defensive line running game coordinator Jerry Montgomery is out. You've still got passing game coordinator Greg Williams in place that we hired last year. Um, you've got defensive backs coach Ryan Downard. You've got inside linebacker coach Kirk Olavadati, I think is how you say it. Pass rush specialist Jason Rebrovich. And then you've got defensive quality control coach uh, Wendell Davis. Obviously, we let go of defensive quality control coach uh, Justin Hood. So you had two of those on staff. Those are kind of the up and comers, if you will. So the reason I wanted to talk about that specifically in these moves. um, All right. So inside linebackers, that position is played totally different in a 34 than it is in a 4-3. So keep an eye on Kirk Olavadati, okay? Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. That one right there, I could see that being a move. That that's yep. be, I could, first of all, I could see all these being moved. I really could, but I'm just trying to think. Okay, you already you already moved your defensive line. You already let defensive quality control coach. Hey, you're probably not going to be here. Pass rush specialist. That's another one. You know, pass rush specialist in a 34. First of all, pass rush specialist. It doesn't matter if you're playing a four three or a 34. You're it's the same moves. It's the same type of technique. Getting getting to the ball. You know, getting to the uh, to the quarterback. Now where it comes into play is playing under control and how that's going to affect uh, the run game defense. And how I, feel, the run. I feel the promotion for Rebovich. You think so? Oh yeah. I, <laughs> I, I don't think he, if he's going anywhere, he's going, he's going up on this okay. staff, I think. Okay. So the only prediction you'll get from me out of here. Oh, and Greg <laughs> Williams is staying. <laughs> that's, those are my two would, predictions. <laughs> yeah, I would be kind of surprised too, if Greg Williams didn't stay, to be honest, but inside linebacker coach is the one that I'm looking at next. Like he might be, you know, yeah. maybe they like him. Maybe they want to keep him. Maybe he does in his background. Uh, maybe Kirk has, you know, background working with a four, three, two. I, I don't know. Or a four, three as well. I should say, I'm not trying to confuse you, but uh, so with those two positions open immediately, you think, okay, what, who are the potential candidates for that? All right. Let's start, first of all, with the – the you remember the the interviews we did, the wave of interviews, right? We did uh, – we interviewed Adam Dirty, the defensive line coach from Dallas. You interviewed Christian Parker, the defensive backs coach from Denver. And you interviewed Baltimore's defensive backs coach, Denard Wilson. So when you kind of look at this – Denard Wilson would need to be promoted to a passing game coordinator. To the best of my knowledge, that hasn't happened. I think he's still with Baltimore in the same position. If you guys have heard otherwise, comment for us. And, Tim, if you'll just kind of keep an eye if someone mentions that. Um, So, of those three, is it possible that they had their D.C. already in Jeff Halfley and they were interviewing these guys to try to fill it out and say, hey, would they be a fit for the upcoming staff? Because if you took someone like Adam Dirty – and said, okay, we want to bring you in as the defensive line coach. Well, that's a lateral move. If they make him running game coordinator and offer him more money than Dallas, I imagine you can make that move happen, right? So something to keep an eye on there. Now, to the best of my knowledge, they're still looking for their D.C. because obviously Dan Quinn took the head coaching job in Washington. So there's still a chance that Adam Dirty could get promoted to D.C. You know, And, And I want to say highly unlikely, but you've seen Zach Orr with just two years coaching experience or whatever it was there. He jumped right to defensive coordinator in Baltimore. So that's definitely a possibility. So those are three names to kind of keep an eye on that, you know, if you really liked Christian Parker, the only way I could see him coming to Green Bay is if he was passing game coordinator, which means you would be getting rid of Greg Williams, right? Now, keep in mind, we hired Greg Williams to coach this previous staff. Now, you would think the secondary's, you know, about the same, but when you look at it, we were trying to play the Fangio scheme, although last year we really got away from it really, really far. Okay. So if he was brought in last year, the year before, whenever it was, to coach within the Fangio, you know, the skeletal structure of the Fangio scheme, 
he's really not a fit for what Jeff Halfley's going to do either because you're going to see more man coverage. You're going to see more middle field close. You're going to see more. We played a ton of cover three last year, first of all. Cover three, middle field close, we played it. But we're going to play less pre-snap sugar and with the safeties, you know, two safeties on the shelf. So with that being said, I don't think Greg Williams is completely safe. It just depends on what Jeff Halfley, uh, you know, prefers. So if you were to see Christian Parker somehow, some way come over from Denver to Green Bay, I think it would be him taking the passing game coordinator job, and that means Greg Williams would be out. If Adam Dirty was to come over, it would be you gave him more money than Dallas, right? He's going to come over and be the new defensive line coach, and he would be the defensive line or the defensive running game coordinator as well, okay? And Denard Wilson, very similar to Christian Parker, if you brought him over, made him passing game coordinator, gave him more money than Baltimore did, that could be possible there. Okay. So just something to mention. There it is. Bang. I thought I heard his name somewhere. So Denard Wilson is in Tennessee as DC. So we can cross him off that list. Wait, um, so, yeah. Did you hear when Tim, Tim, let me know if you guys heard, I, I saw one report and I couldn't corroborate or, uh, corroborate is did the Packers originally offer or the DC job and he turned it down and then we moved on to Halfley. Did you guys see that? So the, I've tried to stay out of this, Jacob, and oh. here you are, man. You you come in here spilling the tea. I love it. You know what I do? <laughs> do what I do. We were just talking about what you do uh, offline a second ago, just talking about the awesome people that we've got kind of coming on the show regularly. And it's like, this is what we're talking about, Tim. The dude is always digging behind the scenes and finding little things, right? Um, so – <laughs> to, the best, to the best of my knowledge, what happened there was someone reported – that they offered him the job. And then I think it was Aaron Negler came back and said, I have sources within the building that said that is not true and quote tweeted those people. So kind of dunked on them and said, nah, I'm going to tell you, you know, Aaron Negler talked to a coach. There's no two ways about it. He yep. has talked to someone on that coaching staff. Um, it, someone was saying the other night that Coach LaFleur, if I remember correctly, unless they were just joking, was actually texting with, Aaron Nagler at one point. So he is really, really plugged in with the coaching staff. So taking Nags's word over whoever the other person was, no offense. I'm sure you do a great job, but um, he's, he's very plugged in in that regard. It's like Matt Schnob and Matt Schnobman's really plugged in when he reports something that's pretty spot on. Um, so with that being said, I don't think that's true, Jacob. I think that that was a false report. Um, I think that they wanted to speak with Zach Orr. They may have spoken to Zach Orr, but it sounds to me like he didn't offer. Now, you guys remember the rumor about Christian Parker, though, how he mm-hmm. was offered the job, and they, yeah. they said that, you know, whatever. I'm wondering, and, and listen, this is speculation. I have no inside information at all, and this is definitely not what Andrew Mertig said, but I'm just so, – just a small part of the back of my brain's going, what if they offered him passing game coordinator – and that got kind of miscon, you know, miscommunicated as he got offered the DC job, and that would explain why he hadn't taken it yet, because he's waiting to get a DC job possibly, right? Which yeah, right. that's a long shot there, and, and honestly, so it could have been the report was a little bit inaccurate. It could be that Andrew got bad information, which that happens to everybody. That's no knock against Andrew or anyone else. So just something to kind of think about there. But um, who was that Tim that said that about Denard Wilson? Uh, Peter, wasn't it? Let's Peter Stone said, okay, yeah. Peter, thank you for looking that up, buddy. I really appreciate you taking the time to do that, man. Um, that's what I love about our show is we got, you know, uh, 500 different people <laughs> in and out of the chat, and they can look up that info real quick. So um, there you go. That's the two vacancies. Those are the ones that we've already interviewed that might be interested in some of those vacancies. Now, other possibilities, too. Check this out. We've got BC's uh, coaching staff, right? So at Boston College – this is Vince. I'm probably going to butcher it, but I'm going to try it. Vince Oga Bossi, I think is how you say it. Oga Bossi. Um, he was the defensive line coach at BC, okay, under Jeff Halfley. <laughs> so that's one that might potentially be, you know, hey, if, if Halfley wants to bring some of his own staff in, um, I don't know. It, I, I think that's somewhat of a long shot because no one looks at that BC, you know, defense and says, man, they really lit it up. Yes, they were lacking in talent compared to some of the other teams they played. I got all that. But this whole notion that <clears throat> that they just had this awesome defense at BC, and, and I'll just say this, it just absolutely cracks me up, the people that are like, well, you can't judge that because he wasn't defensive coordinator. Tell me you don't know what the hell you're talking about without telling me you don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> you're you're going to convince me that Jeff Halfley was hired in to be the BC head coach and he was a defensive-minded coach 
a co-defensive coordinator for Ohio State in 2019. He was hired in to be the head coach, and he had – this is not his defense. What are we – You sure about that? It's, yeah. It makes no sense. It's just – and I won't get into the details. It's not important. Anyway, it, that was Jeff Halfley's defense at the college level with the lack of talent he may or may not have had. And like he said in the interviews, a totally different game. People get so emotional and they get so in their feelings about, I know more than you, I know more than you. It's not about who knows more than who else. It's what are the facts surrounding the situation? That's all that matters. And like Jeff Hapley said in the interviews, college games totally different. When you got more mobile quarterbacks and them, you know, how you got to attack them and you got to play them with two on the shelf, those type of approaches, totally different ball game. It, it's literally, like he said, between the hashes and everything, it's a different game from college to the NFL. So yep. that's why it's important to just kind of everybody back up, slow down a bit and go. It, it's just amazing. You share the numbers and go, yeah, they wasn't a good defense at BC. Oh, my God. They, the Jeff Halfley fanboys, go, they lose their mind. Like, like you're trying to say he's going to be a bad coach. No one's saying that. Stop being so emotional. <laughs> it's none of our listeners. If the person's listening, they know who I'm talking about. But anyway, Vince Ogabasi. Uh, could be a potential candidate for D-line coach, although I'm not very big on it. Now, another couple of people here. You've got Sean Duggan, Sean Dugan, however you pronounce his name. Um, he was at BC as co-defensive coordinator and linebacker coach. Okay, so Wait. what's that? What, what website did you get this from? It, it gives them their phone number and their email address. Yeah, they, they've all got the same phone number, so don't be texting them dirty pics. Right. Right? It's, uh, <laughs> it's, who? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so Sean uh, Sean Dugan, Duggan, however you say his name, he was the linebacker coach at BC. So you guys know, I just mentioned our linebacker coach. How's he going to fit into that 4-3? This is someone, and again, I'm not suggesting they would jump in as a linebacker coach or they would jump in as a defensive line coach, but what did we just talk about? One of our quality control coaches got let go. That might be some, a position that maybe he brings someone from BC to fill those positions, right, to help kind of communicate their verbiage, their defense, that type of thing throughout their organization as far as their coaching staff goes. So that's that's another name to kind of keep an eye on. Um, they had a co-defensive coordinator, too, who was Azar Abdul Rahim, okay? Um, he was a co-defensive coordinator and defensive backs coach. So there's another one, probably a potential candidate for a position coach or a quality control coach, probably more so a quality control coach than anything. So those two guys kind of caught my attention as, okay, you might be plucking them from B.C., and, uh, and putting them on the staff in some some facet. And, you know, I don't think there's a set limit. I could be wrong, but I don't think there's a set limit on how many quality control or lower assistance you can have. Um, so you, you may bring over a, a whole slew of these guys, right? Um, you never know. So uh, the other thing, too, is these co-defensive coordinators, they might be in the running for the BC head coach job. Um, I'm hearing rumors, and I think it might – I think there's a lot of validity to it, too – that uh, Billy O'Brien, old Billy Teapot from New England, the the uh, OC last year in New England, former head coach of the Houston Texans, uh, he went to Bama. He went from the Houston Texans as head coach. He went to Bama, um, had a, had a lot of success as OC down there. Then he went to OC in New England, and then obviously Bill leaving. Some things are going to be shook up there. Alex Van Pelt, I think, was the guy who took the OC job in New England. So now you have Bill O'Brien. It was rumored it might be official now. I don't know to take the head coaching job with Boston College. So if that happens, guess what he's going to do? He's going to be scrapping all these guys, and they're not looking for promotions. So you're probably going to have some of these, one or two, maybe three of these guys hop in as quality control coaches, I think would be a pretty good guesstimation. So what do you guys think about that information there? Um, as far as our vacancies, let's pull up the X's again. <clears throat> Jerry Montgomery out as defensive line uh, coach and running game coordinator. Defensive quality control coach uh, Justin Hood is out. Who would you guys like to uh, interview, bring in, try to fill those spots, man? Jacob? Kevin Green. I wish I could have that guy. If I could bring anybody back on a that coaching is. staff, dude. I just it's think amazing, the fact that he was our linebackers coach. I mean, dude, like how amazing is that? Um, but in honesty, I, I don't honestly know. There's not anybody that jumps off the page. I, as much as I love football, I haven't gotten into the, the depth of knowing the – fantasy football coaching tree i gotta get that that'll come next maybe somewhere through this year but um honestly i i don't i don't know i'd like to see him maybe grab it'd be nice to see him grab maybe a guy or two from that boston college squad just so that he has a little bit of i don't know like he, he, 
anytime that you start a new job or you go into a new aspect of life, it's nice to have like one or two people that you at least know from the previous job struggles, life, whatever it is. Um, but that being said, you know, I, I like the fact that we're shaking things up. I hated the fact that the Packers for a long time, we just, we didn't do, a, you know, Mike McCarthy was known for, he just, you had to basically go to prison to get this guy to fire you, you know, <clears throat> unless you yeah. got hired away from a different squad and LaFleur seemed to be not as dedicated to his guys, but I think that it's nice to shake some things up, get new positions, uh, new guys in new positions. And, you know, I, I really do. I'm excited to see what Halfley can do. I, like I said, I would like to see him maybe at least bring one or two core guys of his, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see how it shakes out. Um, Steven here, and I want to get your take, uh, Tim. Steven in the chat said the Boston College defense wasn't really that bad, I believe. Well, here are the numbers, okay, uh, just to run it down, Steve, because I, I kind of thought the same thing. Everybody was talking about it like, oh, man, this is a great coach. He did a great job at BC. They went to like three straight ball games, whatever. I went and pulled the numbers. Boston College in scoring defense was 74th in the country at 28.3 points per game is what he gave up, okay? Um, BC's passing yards per attempt, they were ranked 84th at 7.6 yards per passing attempt. Against the run, it got even worse. 119th, they were were giving up 5.1 yards per rush. So uh, to answer your question there, man, it was pretty bad. It was bad. Now, again – the Halfley lovers immediately go, well, it wasn't his defense. He wasn't defensive coordinator, and I'm just still mind boggled by that comment. I don't know what to say, Tim. Anyway, buddy, uh, what do you what do you think about these vacancies here, man? I like Aiden Dirty. Um, yeah. I just I do. I like the guy a lot, and uh, you talk about a guy who connects with his players and uh, guys want to play for a uh, guy who's passionate. Um, yeah, that he he'd be my pick. Uh, I think. Can you bring up that chart? again, of our, our staff. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I look and I, you know, <clears throat> whether it's vacancies or, or not, you know, guys getting promoted or not, I think there's some roles that he could step in. Um, you know, maybe it is, uh, I, I, you know, it's tough to, tough to see. I mean, we've got the, uh, defensive line vacancy with mm-hmm. coach Montgomery being out. I mean, I could see Aiden dirty going into that role possibly. Um, but, you know, my other question is, while we look here, is uh, Ryan Downer, our, our defensive backs coach, you know, mm-hmm. do we do we see a change made there with, you know, a new D.C. who is secondary minded? Um, is he looking to bring in, you know, somebody else to coach the DBs? What do you think of that? Well, that's a I think it's a great point. Listen, I'm not here to try to like pile on or dog anybody, but I don't feel like the DBs have gotten better since Ryan Downer got here. Um, right. and, you know, he, I think he was promoted from within to that defensive backs coach role. And I mean, we've seen how the DBs have played and you heard Goody talking about in the press or like, we were not consistent enough in the back seven. Right. And I know everybody's excited about Carrington Valentine. Listen, guys, I'm a, I'm a Kentucky Wildcat fan. I absolutely, you know, I, I want, there's no one who wants Carrington Valentine to work out more than me. Um, the fact that he was a seventh round pick and played so many snaps, that's a huge positive. Right. And what else can you ask from a player? He yep. did grade out somewhere in the 90s as far as passer rating when targeted. So let's not kid ourselves into thinking this guy's a solid corner. Like you're still looking to upgrade that position. And and I think that starts with the defensive backs as well. Um, Maybe you know, uh, Coach Coach Haddad's available for an interview for uh, <laughs> DB's in coach. <laughs> I think he would take that in a heartbeat, no doubt. <laughs> so, um, go ahead, Jacob. You got something you're giggling about over there? I'm <laughs> just <laughs> laughing at half of them. <laughs> just. The one underneath the Clayton. Uh, I don't want to say it because it's yeah, let's <laughs> don't. okay. Let's don't. We just wanted to acknowledge AFAM said something funny in the chat, but we're not allowed to post it. All right. <laughs> so, yeah, when it comes to Ryan Downer, I don't think he's necessarily saved him. I'm just kind of looking at the positions they already kind of axed, right? Um, and, and, you know, adding dirty, how does he fit in to what Jeff Halfley may or may not want to do? What do they do in Dallas? They played a ton. I mean, an absolute ton of man coverage, right? I had the numbers at one point. I may have already dropped them down here. But, uh, you know, they played a, played a ton of man coverage, second most in the league. That means that defensive line has to sync up with a man coverage back in, right? Well, it looks like we're going to be playing more man coverage this year. That doesn't mean more man coverage in zone, guys. I got to keep prefacing that because I, I don't want to create false expectations. When I say more man coverage, more man coverage than we have team that played the most man coverage last year in the league was the Atlanta Falcons. They played it 40% of the time. So they still played zone more than they played man, but they played the most man of the, in the entire league. 
Um, so if you bring in, you know, if Jeff Halfley comes in and he goes, okay, we're going to go from 23% man to 30% man, adding dirty would kind of fit that role as defensive line coach because he's played with man coverage behind him. The problem is their run defense was cheeks. So that worries me a bit, right? I, I'm not saying adding dirty wouldn't make a good defensive line coach or a good, you know, running game coordinator. It's just there's no real fruit on the tree right there right now with what they did in Dallas. And it could have been personnel when you look at their defensive line. Like you got Demarcus Lawrence. He graded out really, really well on both the run and the pass. You got Micah Parsons. And and with those two studs on basically on your defensive line, you still kind of struggle to stop the run. You know what I'm saying? That's a little bit. A little bit iffy for me. Now that was statistics wise, anyway. So, right, right. Uh, you know, just uh, just something to kind of keep keep an eye on there. Um, so, we've kind of hit that pretty extensively. Let's talk about the other hire that was made, um, and that was uh, Sean Mannion, uh, former Rams, Vikings, and Seahawks quarterback. Sean Mannion is ending his nine year playing career and has accepted a position on the Packers coaching staff. A source tells me he'll work with QBs and the passing game. OK, now, who is Sean Mannion? He played, like I said, 25th, uh, 2015, he played for the uh, St. He played for St. Louis and then he went with them to L.A. to the Rams in 2016. He was there in 2017, 2018. So he was with Sean McVay with the L.A. Rams. Right. So I, I'm pretty sure when they went to L.A. in 2016, that was still Jeff Fisher. Feels like a lifetime ago. Then Sean McVay was hired in. So he spent time with Sean McVay. Then he goes to Minnesota, right, with Kevin O'Connell. So both of those, what it says is he knows this McVay slash LaFleur system inside and out, right? So you're getting a strong assistant. I love the fact that they plucked him from the Minnesota Vikings, a division rival. You basically took someone who has spent time with Kevin O'Connell. I'm pretty sure Kevin O'Connell, maybe it was 2022 he went to Minnesota. I'm trying to think. I may have it crossed up. Nonetheless, you're taking him. His most recent stint was with a division rival, right? You bring him over. He knows the floor system. Here's the negative part that really, really worries me. What does this mean for Tom Clements? Are we? Is this the first tip of the iceberg that maybe Tom Clements has let them know probably not coming back? I hope that's not the case. You guys know how I feel about Tom, but that's the first thing that comes to mind. Or it could be. They know Tom is going to be stepping away soon. He's getting a little little older, right, and he wants to enjoy life, I'm sure. Maybe they're putting this guy in place to study under Tom Clements. That sounds a lot better to me because that – I don't know about you guys, but that worries me, the thought of Tom Clements leaving um, this year. But what do you guys think about that Sean Mannion hire there as far as uh, how it may play into Tom Clements' future? Uh, I'm with you. I'm a little bit, little bit nervous about letting the – the quarterback whisperer go. But then again, we also have to respect the fact that, you know, Tom came out of retirement once already um, and came back to, to coach. And, uh, you know, it may be a, a scenario where he's, you know, looking to hang it up and, and go back to retirement. Um, but I'd love to see him back at least, even if it's, uh, you know, twisting his arm and saying, hey, one more year, <laughs> one more year. Um, but yeah, I mean, it makes you think. Uh, also, you were correct. Uh, Kevin O'Connell, uh, 2022, he took over at at uh, Minnesota. Um, but you know, I think uh, when it comes to the quarterbacks, um, you know, we know what we're doing here. So I trust uh, I trust any any hire that that's made at, at that position. I really do, and uh, I'm all for poaching people from from Minnesota. Anytime we can get keep somebody away from a division rival or get some intel on a division rival, I'm all for it. But uh, you know, either way about it, Tom Clements, uh, those are big shoes to fill. Uh, whoever steps into that role, um, and uh, you know, Jordan, you know, he's been here with Jordan for a few years, um, so like that's not going to be lost. Uh, anything that he's gained uh, by having uh, Tom Clements there, I, you know, maybe we see him slide away from that that quarterbacks coach role, and maybe he's like a senior advisor or something. You know, kind of like a semi semi retirement kind of role, maybe lighten the load. Um, still have him in the building um, for input, but that's yeah. just pure pure speculation and dreaming. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll see how this plays out. I'm all for Tom Clement staying, um, but we also got to know that you know there's things bigger than football, and uh, you know, yeah, he's in his 70s that he may want to retire. You know, yeah, like Donald says in the chat, Clements is 71, has already retired once. Yeah, I mean, I dude, when I get 71, yeah, I don't want anybody calling me. I'm <laughs> I'm gonna be I'm gonna be in the woods somewhere. 
off the grid, <laughs> living my best life. Nobody you're sitting on a porch somewhere, sipping moonshine, cleaning your shotgun. Oh, That's what you're white doing. lightning out there on the trail, man. Come <laughs> on, dude. You talk about the American dream. Speaking of the American dream, Justin in the chat says the transfer portal is hurting college football teams like BU. I think he meant BCU. Uh, it's true, it is hurting them. Um, but like AFAM says in here, the transfer portal is patriotism at its finest, land of the free. What you're seeing with this wild, wild west approach with the with the transfer portal in college football, for those of you who don't keep up with it, this was long overdue. They were, for the longest time, you're not going to find any other profession, quote-unquote profession or anything, across the great United States of America. And I said great because I still think it is great. I think we've got problems, but I think we're still the greatest country in the world. If you don't like that, I don't care. You can be wrong. But when you kind of look at how the transfer portal has worked, they're making up for lost time. For the longest time, it was you guys aren't allowed to have a job. You're going to answer to us, and we're going to let you go to school and play football. Shut up. You can't make any money. And if, if we catch you, if we catch you selling your own autograph, we're going to kick you out of the game. That is just wild to me. It's always been wild to me. I've never understood that approach. It's like, you do not own these kids. I'm sorry you don't. They're playing football, got you, and there needs to be regulations on everything. I got it. But that is just so freaking stupid. So they withheld, withheld, withheld. It finally got in front of Congress. What happens? They're going, Congress looked at it on both sides and was like, hey, y'all are idiots. Like, this is this is pretty crooked what y'all are doing to these young <laughs> young guys and gals. I got some advice for y'all. Take two weeks off, then quit. <laughs> exactly. So what happened is they come in, struck the hammer down the NCAA, they removed the restrictions, and now it's just turn it loose. If they had approached it years before, decades before, you probably could have done it a little bit easier transition, but they kept trying to keep their greedy hands and everything, and uh, it backfired on them. So, But, yeah, I agree, AFAM. Transfer portal is patriotism at its finest. No doubt about it. Um, the other more important comment, and I'm going to get your take on Tom Clements, Jacob, uh, actually came in here from uh, Paul Robertson. He says, uh, Jacob puts rims on his Schwinn bicycle. Is that true, man? You got spinners on that thing? No, but I had some pretty sweet pegs growing up. That's <laughs> some yeah. sweet. Huh? Take it. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Getting all the yeah. girls rides, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, I was going to just real quick say that, you know, like Tim said, I don't know how you replace a guy like Tom Clements with anybody. and He's got big shoes to fill, and I, don't get me wrong, Sean Mannion seems like a decent enough guy, but if I read that stack correctly, we're looking at a guy like a, a, a idle goat, Tom Clements, with a guy, Sean Mannion, who played in 14 games, started three, and he's 0 for 3. Um, that's so that's a very good some, point. <laughs> he's got some really good Viking intel, but I don't know if that's worth, you know, it, we yeah, talked about like how, how, the, how the, the D-backs maybe took a downgrade with uh, that uh, coach, Ryan or whatever his name was there. I would really hate to see Jordan Love make a downgrade because he's taking advice from Sean Mannion versus Tom Clements. So I would say give that guy, buy him all the ice cream and what I don't know what old people like. Uh <laughs> put, on, put on prices right. You know, I don't know. Just you sure about what you that? Did you sure about that? Oh, ice cream. No I love thing. it. I love it. Yeah, really? when you when you look at Sean Mannion's stats, it looks like they gave Clayton a football and said, "Go out there and play quarterback." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Paul, uh, Rob, yeah, we don't we don't want Jay Love's cadence to change to. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul Robertson said NIL isn't transfer portal. No, it's not. But they are like this, brother. They are interlocked. The transfer portal is free agency for. Basically, the transfer portal is the free agency period, right? And the NIL is the lack of a salary cap, to be honest with you. <laughs> like in the Did NFL, the, um, everybody's got these regulations. You can only spend so much, right? In college football, it's like, Go get the money from your boosters. Make it happen. Did, like, did you see uh, Scott Van Pelt on um, ESPN did a nice little report about the you know sustainability of all this? Did you right. did you catch that that like going going down the road here, you know, as the years progress, the amount of money at play is that it's, is that sustainable? Like how deep are the pockets of these boosters? They're you know? deep, but I think what you'll see is they're going to spend a ton of money, and some teams aren't going to get a return on that investment. So that money's going to run dry, and another team's going to pop up and take advantage, and another team. So 
you know, the, the thing that I do like about it, first of all, there need, there needs to be a universal rule put in place, some kind of salary cap. That is not antitrust. That's not, you know, illegal as, as opposed to telling a 18, 19 year old, you're not allowed to make money. That's right. just, again, I can't, I can't say that's it. absolutely wild to me, but you know, what they're going to need is some kind of salary cap in place. And they've all got to agree on that before it happens though. I think what happens to him is like, you've got some of these schools that are never good at football, but their pockets are loaded right now. Right. Some people are already reading between the lines. They're going Clayton. Clayton's a Kentucky fan. <laughs> Kentucky has an awesome basketball program that churns in all kinds of money. So they can bleed some of that money and those boosters into the football program and make them win. You caught me. That's exactly what I'm saying. Like that's a good example of you can some of these teams that have a boatload of money but have never had prestige and, and been able to create a good football program. Watch out come from the back. So watch out for those Ivy League schools. Here they come. Yes, exactly. Here they come. Bro, seriously. Like Princeton's yeah. number one team in the country. <laughs> yeah. Cornell coming in strong. Yeah, Yale. Speaking of Ivy League schools, AFAM went to an Ivy League school and he said, oh, yeah. um, Paul rides a Huffy and returns it to Walmart the day before the return policy expires. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell's going on out here? AFAM's got some doozies, man. There's no doubt. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, Nick McSwain says, I'm glad college players getting paid, but kind of screws over the schools that aren't elite. See, I look, you just heard me, Nick. I kind of see it a little bit different. Now, there are some schools. I, you're, you're right there. Um, the schools that are the big the big money makers, they're the ones who have the advantage, or at least the ones that's got the big boosters. And in some cases, those schools aren't elite um, from a sense of a football standpoint, but they're elite in other aspects where they've got a ton of money coming in, right? So, um, If you want to see a very <clears throat> hilarious and, yes, inappropriate take on how the college – football scheme used to be south park did a good take on it a few years ago oh before. god it's, i can only imagine it's, it's <laughs> i love it um let's see amani i hope i'm saying that right how would you say that name jacob what you got oh, here no, sorry the chat on the screen what's that guy's uh, name oh uh amoni 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 all right he says they should have a cba that would fix the problem yeah. I think it would. You have just, you know, C CBA just collectively bargained agreement, right? Everybody come together and go, all right, here are the rules we all have to play under. Um, now they'll fight it and there'll be, I don't know if there'll be strikes, but there'll be a lot of disagreements when it comes to that. There's no doubt about that. So um, just like with the NFL, but there you go. We covered a lot today though. The other news that really dropped it, it's not really news pertaining to the Packers, although some people were going, will Luke Getze be back if he doesn't get a job? It sounds like Cliff Kingsbury turned down the Raiders' job at the last second for OC, and it sounds like, you know, according to Ian Rappaport earlier this morning, the Raiders find their OC after all as Luke Getze is set to be the new Las Vegas OC. Uh, he quote tweeted Albert Breer said the Raiders are working on a deal to hire ex Bears OC Luke Getze as their new offensive coordinator. The highly respected Getze was in the mix for a bunch of OC jobs in the cycle. You know, people were dogging Getze because of how bad Chicago was. Chicago was bad long before Getze got there. Um, I think Getze's a bright young mind. You've heard Aaron Rodgers talk about how much he liked him. Um, so I, I, I didn't think there was going to be an issue with him getting a job anywhere. Now, I was a little worried about him coming back to Green Bay because we've got a lot of offensive momentum. That's the part that bothered me. You can have a good coach come in with good intentions, and it kind of disrupt things where we're already moving in the right direction. So I think uh, someone on our staff that's, uh, that's probably going to be looking to uh, move on to greener pastures sooner rather than later is wide receiver coach uh, Jason Brable. That dude, what he did with that young receiver core last year, my God. And and I'll be honest, man, the year before I was a little sour on him. I was kind of like, man, we underperformed. I mean, we, at one point, I, I think we finished the league tied for the league in drops, right, You know, for wide receiver drops. And it's just like, is this guy the guy for the job? Last year, boy, he, he said, Clayton, shut your damn mouth. And I said, yes, sir. Great job. <laughs> I mean, he, Jason Brable, amazing job with that receiver core. Um, so actually let's wrap up with that. We got a quick video on Jaden Reed and Dontavian Wicks. Um, and obviously Jason Brable gets a lot of credit for that. What a segue. Didn't even plan that. Here we go. Video from Packers.com. You guys can check it out on their YouTube channel for free. Make sure you like, subscribe to their YouTube channel. Obviously you found us, you found them already. You can also see it on their Twitter account, Packers Twitter account. Make sure you guys go share that stuff. Let's be strong as a fan base um, and make sure everybody's seeing it. But 
Here we are, Jaden Reed and Dontavian Wicks. When the Packers entered must-win mode, they called on Jaden Reed. Touchdown, Jaden Reed! He is dominant here tonight! In Week 17 and 18, Reed turned on the Jets, burning by defenders to the tune of 200-plus yards and two scores. Over his 16 games, Reed broke the franchise rookie receptions record, carving up cornerbacks for 64 grabs, nearly 800 yards, and 10 total touchdowns, leading the team in all three categories. You can see Jaden's explosive ability. He's done a great job making some really big plays for us. He's got a lot more comfortable with the system, with the routes he's running, um, where to be. Got a man out there, leaping grab, touchdown Green Bay Packers! He is a dog. He's a war daddy, and he goes out there, and he's such a competitor. He's got a lot of confidence in him. A stellar season for the man they call Bird, and he's got a wingman and fellow rookie receiver, Dontavian Wicks. Pass to Wicks, and he finds the goal line for the touchdown. Number 13 went on a late-season tear, posting four scores in his final four games. Caught for the touchdown, Dontavian He's going out there and he's making plays. He's getting in the right spot. And then obviously when the ball gets in his hands, he's making plays after the catch. So he's a great player and something we got to just continue to build on going forward. I look up to him. You know, it's a lot of things that he can do that I can't, you know, that I can help, you know, implement into my game. So, you know, we all always coach each other up. You know, that's my brother. You know, I, I, I hang out with him outside this building. So, you know, we got that relationship where we can, you know, push each other to be better. Uh, if we're not doing something the right way, we coach each other. All right, there you go. Um, obviously, just a great, great rookie season for both of those guys. Um, you know, what AFAM says here, I can't disagree with. He says, I'll say this again, Wicks over Watson. And he said, regardless of health, I agree. They're two different type of players. They got two different strengths. But you guys heard me about, I don't know, two-thirds of the way through the season. I said, Dontavian Wicks is the best receiver on this roster. Now, Jaden Reed stepped up in those big moments, like we said. It's it's great that you got two guys competing for that number one, what you consider the number one spot. But the thing with LaFleur's offense, you're going to have guys that are playing different roles, right? You you need as many players as possible to be able to play what we call flyer F, right? Because they're the ones that's going to be doing a lot of that quick exit motion, um, what we refer to as quick motion. Um, and then you can utilize that with the yo-yo, right, effect to get defenses, uh, you know, in a little bit more – advantageous situation from the offensive side of the ball. So yep. um, I agree, though, man, Wicks, Wicks seems like he has everything it takes to be the number one receiver. Um, I like what Steve says here in the chat. He said, Wicks and Reed is our sharp and Robert Brooks. Shoot, man, if he, if they, if either of those guys turn out being half as good as, as Sterling Sharp, we're in for a good 10-year run here. And, man. and hopefully they play twice as long of a career as those two guys as well. Absolutely. Uh, Peter Stone says, don't forget y'all to hit that like button and subscribe. Appreciate that, Peter. Yeah, if you guys would, just take a second, hit the like button so other Packer fans can find this channel, find this content. Also, you can find uh, links in the description of this video to BetUS. If you uh, actually register with BetUS as a new customer, it'll let them know by using the link in this description. It'll let you know, let them know that uh, you were sent to them from PTA. They're the official sports book of Packers Total Access. We were excited about bringing them on board this year. Obviously, going to be a really cool partnership moving forward there. Uh, they are the official sports book of Packers Total Access Live. Been around since, uh, gosh, for 30 years now, since 1994. Got a really cool, cool interface. Make sure you guys go check that out. Also, the QR code in the upper right. Thank you, Tim. If you scan that QR code, that'll send you to Packernet Podcast, where you can find this show in podcast form, as well as the flagship Packernet Podcast by Ryan Schlipp. Packernet After Dark, the call-in show for Packernet uh, fans, and then also Jake Shavink's It's Always Draft Season podcast, phenomenal podcast. You guys know we did a, a marathon last night with him, about an hour and 40 minutes just breaking down all the senior bowl information. So he does an excellent job there. Make sure you guys go uh, like, subscribe, wherever you get your podcasts there, Packernet Podcast Network. So let's go around the horn here once. Jacob, you got anything else you want to add, buddy? I just think it's amazing. Guys in the chat, help me with this because I'm, I'm spacing. Who would you consider would be the best Packers squad of wide receivers that we ever had. You'd have to say it would be the uh, driver, Jennings. Who the, who else was it? James Jones. And was it Tay? It was a Jordy, Jordy Nelson. Jordy. That's right, Jordy. I would argue that going into year two of this squad, that I'd be more excited 
with the fact that we've got the squad that we have, and we don't even talk about guys yet, like freaking Melton. You know what I mean? Like just Malik with their, Heath. Malik Heath. I mean, guys, Dobbs. When you're sitting there talking about whether or not it's Wicks or Reed, in my head, I'm going, man, I think Dobbs is number one. Like, how crazy is that that you could make an argument logically and realistically that maybe four out of our six receivers could be legitimate number one receivers yeah. based on you know whatever you want to call maybe an x or a number one but that dominant boundary we say whatever you want to call it it's it's unreal we've got more slot guys than i can ever remember in our lives like it's just so 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 encouraging so fun and we haven't even hit draft yet like we don't even know what shiny new pieces we got to play with bro i'm just it's crazy I hope those shiny new pieces are in the form of a, a solid stud playmaking safety. That's what I'm wanting. Take a couple swings at safety. Yeah. Let's get that short up ASAP, right? You know, you guys know I'm big on Jeremiah Trotter Jr. as well. Like, if he's there at a certain spot, I'm cool with taking him. I would rather you focus on safety and let's bring back Quay, Devondre Campbell, Isaiah McDuffie. That would be your starting three in a 4-3. It doesn't mean you can't approach it later in the draft. I guess what I'm saying is I'd be okay with taking a, a linebacker a little bit early, like the second or third round, to try to give some competition there for those guys. But also, man, you're going to have an opportunity within the first two picks to get a really good safety. I believe that. So let's go out and get that shirt up. Tim, what else you got, buddy? Yeah, I think just going back to receiver, um, you know, we are. It, it, this this receiving room is loaded to go on a run here. And it, we, we got to make something happen. We got to get over the hump. I believe in the next year or two, because let's be realistic, you know, looking to the future, you know, these guys aren't going to be on rookie contracts forever. And you're going to be in a position where you're going to have to break out the checkbook. And, uh, you know, I don't know how many of these young, talented receivers we end up keeping uh, in the long term. So right now, while they're young and they're relatively inexpensive, we got to we got to try and uh, lock and load to make a run because we do have depth there. I think uh, with Wicks and Reed, the thing that I like so much is Reed gives you, you know, you alluded to it, Clayton. He gives you that ability to, you know, use motion. You know, we talk about the yo-yo motion or one of my favorites is seeing Reed in that orbit motion that we talk about. And you draw the attention of that defense and they're all, they're all worried about, you know, Jaden Reed. And then they get torched by Tay Wicks, you know, running a post or running up the seam. Um, that's a that's the advantage of not really having that true number one. I love the fact that we're uh, our receiver room is by committee, and each day, each game, each quarter, sometimes you could see that that number one role switch. Sometimes it's Dobbs, sometimes it is Wicks. Um, I mean, the depth there is just something to be excited for. That being said, I'm 110 percent with you, Clayton. Draft a safety, draft two safeties in the first round. I don't care. Use up six picks on, on it safety, picks. whatever, whatever you've got to do. Um, we got to help that that back end of that defense out a little bit, um, which I, I'm I'm sure Goody will will address in the in the draft. So, lot to look forward to. Um, just an exciting time uh, to be a Packer fan. It really is. Yeah, for sure. Just uh, people commenting on what you said, Jacob. SDM forty says that Jennings group was more was more explosive. Um, the only way to answer this question is to say, okay, which receiver core would you choose to start a to start a franchise with? I'd have to go with the Jordy, Jennings, Driver, that whole core. But I will say this, going into this season, and we get, you know, three quarters of the way through the season and Jordan Love gets hot, it's like he is his numbers are better with lesser talent than Aaron Rodgers had his first year starting. That's a fact. Yep. Right? There's no two ways about that. Now, the upside, like you're saying, Jacob, you could be totally spot on. Like, we may look up in three years and go, dang, it ain't even close. This receiving core is way better than that receiving core. It could be, you know, it could be true. Um, it's just a little, for right now, it's a little too early for me. Uh, I think I agree with SDM40 when he says that Jennings group is more explosive. Um, everybody else in the chat, they said, I love, Steve says, I love Malik Keith. Malik Keith's solid. Another one, Bo Melton. Bo Melton just showing out last year. Paul Robertson says, I agree with Jacob. Been telling everyone this is the deepest uh, group of receivers ever in Green Bay. I hope you guys are right, man. That would be absolute. Could you imagine, Jacob? Bro, <laughs> that's going to be awesome. Absolutely awesome. Um, Chewy says, uh, certainly the most excited I've been for our offense in, in some time, no doubt. Deadfish says, Lofton and Jefferson was a good duo, but I don't remember who else was we had back then. Anybody with Lofton back in the day, I'm sure it was good, right? Taking all that attention away. AFAM says, going to have to do an emergency pod when J-Love brings these guys out to Cali. Have Paul 
hid in the bushes to take him. <laughs> there you go. I guess he's talking about Paul Brettel. Is that who he's talking about? <laughs> Hopefully it's not Paul Robertson. He'll get, Paul he'll, get arrested. He'll, get, he'll get arrested, no doubt, right? Them guys yeah. are going to look over there like, who? Yeah. And they're going to slap them cuffs on him. We'll see it on the uh, – on the well, I don't know where they meet in Cali, but we'll see on the local Cali news. He'll be handcuffed screaming this on his way to the cruiser. Who do you think you are? I am. <laughs> in other right, news. Well, we're officially <laughs> off the rails. We're gonna get out of here, guys. Appreciate y'all hanging out with us. Um, you guys, uh, this has been a it's been a fun, fun episode, man. We'll be back tonight for PTA Live. I'm sure we'll have something else to talk about. Maybe we'll get some some of those vacancies filled or at least get some interviews set up, that type of thing. Some other pieces I'm sure will continue to fall into place like Dallas is D.C. That'll tell a lot, too, because, like, if they go out of the building and hire a D.C., there's a chance that adding dirty doesn't fit what they do there, right? That's another one. So there's a lot of different things that could uh, could unfold here today. So we'll see you guys tonight. Um, like I said, thank you all for hanging out with us. For those of you listening on the pod, thank you for making us a part of your day. As always, let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world. And go, Pat, go. Go.